This is Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. Let us listen to the Word of God. So when they had come together, they asked Him, Lord, is this the time when You will restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by His own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be My witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When He had said this, as they were watching, He was lifted up and a cloud took Him out of their sight. While He was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken away from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw Him go into heaven. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. First, I'm going to apologize and thank you, Beverly. Apologize for just running right through that stop sign, uh, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, I just kind of got on autopilot, and but you stopped me. So uh, that's my. I even heard y'all practicing it earlier, and I failed. Um, and this is the first time in quite a while, but uh, I'll say this, then we'll move on. Um, at the beginning of worship, I just got real sick. That's why I came out of my robe. I don't know if I just got too hot. I don't know what's going on, but uh, that's why I came out of the robe. So um, uh, anyway, we'll make it through. I'm 51 years old. And I may not remember every lesson that my teachers taught me in school. But while I may not remember the lessons that they taught me, I remember some conversations that took place. Because every single year, at least once, this conversation took place. And it took place when I was like in high school. It took place in college. And it took place in graduate school. And it has taken place in my kids, with my kids, as they were in school. It took place in confirmation class. And when I'm doing new officer training, training for new elders, and it takes place there as well. So I may not remember the exact lessons, but I remember this conversation. So typically what will happen, as we are nearing the end of the class, the end of the semester, the end of whatever training thing is going on, the teacher would usually say, you need to get ready for your final exam. Someone in the class, I don't care if it's, again, confirmation, elders, whatever class, someone's going to ask, what's on the test? And what they mean is, look, we've gone over all of this material. Is all of it going to be on it? Now, I had some teachers that would say, if I covered it in class, it's important and you need to know it. And I'm sure it's true. But I also had some teachers that understood what was going on. And so they would play along and they would say, I tell you what, if you would focus on these chapters, if you would focus on these sections, and I think they would, they would do that because they knew there was a whole wealth of, of information and they didn't want us wasting our time, or, and, and I shouldn't say wasting our time, they didn't want us committing our time to studying some things that are important but not the most important. They were trying to help us focus our attention on the most important thing. We often will say, don't major in the minors. Okay? We want to give our attention to the most important thing. And so while I know I've covered a lot of exciting and important material in the confirmation class, there were some things I would rather them be studying at the end than some others. The importance of our text today is that it lays out the mission of the church. 
that not just the church for those disciples, but the church for all generations. The importance of this exchange is the disciples are basically saying, Lord, is everything you've done on the final exam? And so Jesus is going to try to help focus their thoughts so that they don't just run helter-skelter and just scatter everywhere, but that they become focused on the most important thing. When we enter the text this morning, Jesus is standing with His disciples. And naturally, and it really is, understanding everything that's been going on, there is this natural questions that the disciples have because they still think that Jesus is going to physically and politically overthrow the Romans and bring about this revolution, establish a new government, reestablish the kingdom of Israel on its own. Their question, which is natural for the day, is, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? It's not a bad question, but I want us to reframe the question. I want us to rewrite that question in a way that we might would ask it today. You see, our question would be this, Lord, is this the time in which you are going to return to earth and establish your kingdom? Is this the time of the second coming? I remember several years ago, and it happened periodically, there was a date, someone had a date, and it was supposed to be in the fall, the spring. And then that day came and went, and they said, oh wait, I miscalculated, it's gonna be like October 25th or something, I don't remember what it was. And I just remember on the 24th, not knowing what to do. Because the next day was Sunday, and that was supposed to be the day Jesus returned. Did you prepare your sermon? Do you think about lunch? What's gonna happen? Everybody wants to know when Jesus is going to return. But what Jesus says, what Jesus does is he wants to redirect the question of the disciples. And basically what he says is, look, that's the question everybody wants to know the answer to, but that's not the question I want you to ask. You see, what Jesus wants us to do is rather than try to predict the time of his return, trust that he will return and get busy with what we're supposed to be doing. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by His own authority. I don't worry about the second coming. I trust it's going to be here, but me trying to figure it out is useless. And I don't think that's where we're supposed to spend our energy. Okay? There's something natural about it, but we shouldn't be worried about it. If we're living faithfully, don't worry about when He's coming back. Okay? That's not where we are to put our energy or our focus. So instead, Jesus redirects them to something much more important. He says, but, you know, don't worry about that, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That is what the final exam is. Not when's the kingdom coming, but that right there is the final exam. So let us look first at, at what it is that Jesus wants the disciples and us to focus on. And what He wants us to focus on is the mission of all believers. He tells them that they will be His witnesses. Believers in Jesus Christ are called, even commanded, to testify to the saving work of Jesus Christ. His teaching. His life. His crucifixion. His resurrection. I don't think it's a matter of choice. I don't think it's a matter. I don't think Jesus is saying, look, if you feel like it, go and be my witnesses. What Jesus says is, you will be my witnesses. You are to be my witnesses. By a show of hands, how many of you believe Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Don't be scared to raise them. Most of you have. I'm assuming some of you are just too shy. Okay? By professing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you now are commanded to be His witnesses. To teach the story of Jesus Christ. To teach what His death means for sinful humanity. To teach about His resurrection that defeated the powers of sin and death. To teach the promise of an eternal life for all who believe and receive Him as Lord and Savior. That's the mission. The final exam that every single one of us is called to take. Now when you stop and think about it, the mission that Jesus leads with the church is really quite simple. 
teach others about Jesus Christ. That's it. That is simple. You can't get much more simple than that. Teach about Jesus. That's the mission of this church and every other Christian church. Jesus says that we are to do this in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now when we look at these geographic destinations or, or descriptions, they mean a couple of things. One of the first things we ought to know is what Jesus is telling them, look, it's not always going to be easy and it's not always going to be safe. Imagine that you're living in this time. Think about what's going on in Jerusalem. Not too long ago, Jesus was crucified. Not too long ago, they were hunting down the believers. And where is Jesus sending His believers now? To Jerusalem. Who wants to go back there? That's where the fire is. But that's where Jesus is sending them. It also means that we must be that we must be about sharing Jesus right here in our own church. We must be about sharing Jesus beyond these walls and in the community around us. We must be about sharing Jesus beyond the community around us and in this country. And we must be about sharing Jesus beyond the borders of this country and go into all the world. There is no biblical mandate to be comfortable in your own church and stay there. There's no biblical mandate to just serve your local community. That's where we begin. And that may be where we put our emphasis, but we are called to much bigger things. We must go into all the world. But here's something else that we must understand about this call to be a witness of Jesus Christ. It is a call to every believer. Every believer. Right? It's capitalized, it's bolded, it's highlighted, and it's underlined. Right there. Every believer receives this call. No one is excluded. Every single one of us who profess faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and already had you raise your hands must roll up our sleeves and pitch in. We cannot sit back and wait for others to do it. There's a story of a school teacher years and years ago. There's a teacher from Scotland. And I don't know if it was through an accident or something at birth, but this man had one leg. And so he approached um, J. Hudson Taylor asking to be sent to mission uh, to China to do mission work. And Taylor looked at him and he asked, with only one leg, why do you think of going to China as a missionary? And his response was, I do not see those with two legs going. None of us have an excuse. We cannot say, and I've heard this way too many times over 20 years, we cannot say, I've been there and I've done that and it's time for somebody else. We cannot say that we're too old or too young. We cannot say that we don't have enough time. None of us have enough time. There is something for every single one of us in the kingdom of God to do. Perhaps we can't do what we once did. That's fair. I get that. But we can offer ourselves in some positive and helpful way. June 29th, and I've said this, okay, and it's not overly important, but June 29th was my 20th anniversary of my ordination. And what I will tell you honestly, in that 20 years, I have never seen a church that should lack for Sunday school teachers, youth leaders, children's church leaders, committee members, ushers, choir members, and the list is going to go on to on. There is no reason that we don't have people waiting in the wings to do it. Look around. If you're still looking at me, you're not doing what I've asked. Look around. Look beside you, look behind you, look in front of you. Really, I'm not moving on until I see some heads turning. There is no reason that we have to have people stand up and say, we need Sunday school teachers. No reason that we need to say, we need help doing this, whatever this is. Because all of us, as believers in Jesus Christ, have received that call to be His witnesses and His servants. 
We don't have the same call, but we had, I mean, in terms of the particulars, but we all have that call. There is absolutely no loopholes in the command of Jesus Christ for each one of us to go into the world. You cannot say, I cannot say, well, this doesn't apply to me. I've done that. It's time for somebody else. Yes, you may have done that, but guess what? You might need to keep doing that. And if you've never done that, whatever that is, it might be time. I've never done it. Okay. My daddy used to love to say, well, dad, I've never done that. My dad would love to say, well, you're never going to do it younger. Okay, If you've never done something, you will never do it at a younger age. Maybe now's the time to step up. But don't respond to this call out of obligation or guilt. Respond out of your passion for Jesus Christ and the desire for everyone to know Him. When you looked and saw the youth, and I'm picking on those, and I'm picking on a lot of folks today, but when those youth stood up, it's not about feeling guilty that they don't have a teacher. Now, if that's what it takes, fine. But ultimately, it should be our passion to help them grow in their faith. These kids that go out for children's church, it should be our passion to nurture them. Yes, we took vows at their baptism, but our passion as believers in Jesus Christ ought to lead us where we have an overflow list of people to teach that and lead that. It just should. As we respond, it ought to be out of our passion. That's why we're here. I hope you don't come to church out of obligation. But that passion to grow in your own faith and to hopefully lead others. Any other reason for being here falls short. But here is some more good news. Jesus did not simply give them marching orders and tell them to go. If you are paying attention when I read, and if you've been paying attention to my sermon, then what you know notice is I either skipped a part or I'm flipping it around. See, I began with the mission. I began where Jesus says, go and be my witnesses. But where Jesus begins is somewhere completely different. Because while the, while the mission is really simple, and that's to teach others about Jesus, from a human standpoint, if that's what we rely on, our own ability, it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible. It's overwhelming to think of what that mission is from a human standpoint. I began with the mission. Jesus began with the promise. Jesus began, before Jesus even got to the mission, He wanted to, He's much nicer than I am. You see, He wanted to bring comfort. He first said, you're going to receive power. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. It's going to enable you and empower you. And they're probably going, for what? Ah, that's a good question. Because you're going to go be my witness. We are left with the promise that the Work we're called to do is going to be empowered not by our own energy and ability, but empowered by the Holy Spirit. And when we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, we can do great things. I don't care what your experience is. I don't care what your expectations are. When we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, we can do great things. We have to know that and we have to trust that. We need to pray regularly, regularly that the Holy Spirit would empower us and that we would recognize that. So that we would have that comfort and that peace. This is an amazing passage. Because it records the last words of Jesus to His disciples. You are to be my witnesses to all the world, and you will be empowered by the Holy Spirit. But notice what they do when He ascends to heaven. As Jesus is taken away... They stand there and watch. And my guess is, as they stood there and watched, they continued to stand there and watch. Because they're standing there watching Jesus ascend to heaven. Angels appear behind them or beside them. They don't even notice them. And finally those angels say, what are y'all doing? That Jesus that you're watching, He's going to come back the same way He went away. You've got work to do. They were frozen by His absence. But those angels basically tell them, remember what He said. You're going to have the power of the Holy Spirit and you have work to do. You see, 
Friends, we as a church and as individuals must be about the mission that Jesus Christ has given us to be His witness. We must be about the ministry of this church. We must be about sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And that means every single one of us has to do what we can do. But we must also work together to carry the message into the world beyond these walls, beyond this community, uh, into all parts of the world. So let us know. Let us receive that mission from Jesus Christ. And let us be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do His work. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, we come before You and we offer ourselves to You. We come and we ask that You would strengthen us to undertake the mission that You've put before us. Help us to move beyond our own limitations and boundaries and fears and even wants and desires that we may be willing to do our part to serve You. And may that part then not only strengthen this church, but strengthen Your kingdom. Christ name. Amen. I'm going to ask the ushers to come up. And I'm going to ask you to do two things. One, I want you to, to be in prayer. Both of these things are going to follow out of prayer. Prayer, pray how you can respond to God with your, your financial gifts. Financial gifts strengthen this church. It's not just about paying bills. It's about being enabled and empowered to, to carry on our ministry. But also then be in prayer of how you can be involved in that. How you can take seriously and respond to Jesus' message and challenge to be His witness. The offertory we're going to do is not the one that's printed in the bulletin. Again, uh, I was kind of blindsided Beverly this morning. Uh, so it's my fault. We want to do a song... Uh, it's called, I Am Not Alone. Now the song, there's some really powerful words in here. And the song is really about the presence of God in the most difficult time. But the recurring uh, chorus is, I am not alone. And we need to trust that in, in difficult times, as well as times of joy, that God is with us. At the most exciting times, in the most disappointing times, God is with us. When we are afraid and, and when we're full of energy, God is there. So let us come before God and offer all that we are and all that we have. I am not alone. 
deep sorrow I see your light is breaking through The dark of night will not overtake me I am pressing into you Lord, you find my every battle I will not fear I am not alone I am not alone You will go before me You will never leave me Trials, you've always been faithful. 